Here's my old phone from five years ago, the Galaxy S20 Plus running Tomb Raider from 2013 on a Windows emulator. And here we're playing God of War Ragnarok with the help of my gaming PC. And this is the Java or PC edition of Minecraft running natively on the device. Today we're going to look at the best and most unexpected ways you can game on your phone, and I hope this video opens you up to new ways to play some of your favorite games. At the end of the video, I'll give you some suggestions and tips on how to game with your phone, but without further ado, let's get into the video. I think phones nowadays are a great pick for people who want an all-round device. Of course, I wouldn't buy something like the Galaxy S25 Ultra for $2,000 Canadian, but for just $265 Canadian or $195 USD, the Galaxy S20 Plus is a gaming console, a workstation, an entertainment machine, and of course, a phone all in one. But now, the Galaxy S20 is a bit dated with its Snapdragon 865 processor, so it won't be as strong for certain tasks like higher graphics in games, Switch emulation, or Windows games, but it's still capable enough for a good time in many titles. So let's start with some Android games from the Play Store before we look at the crazy stuff. Grid Autosport is a full console and PC racing title that was ported to Android in 2019. It uses lots of the same assets that the PC version used, and here with the graphics mode, we stay around 30 FPS, although you can see it drop a bit during intense moments. In the performance mode, we get a stable 60 FPS, although things don't look quite as sharp. You can probably notice it on screen, but the improved FPS does feel a lot better. Wreckfest is another racing title that was ported to Android, but here they changed the physics so it can be easier to run on phones. Although with the high settings, we start a race with 30 FPS, but it drops down to the low 20s pretty quick. So I adjusted the settings a bit, mainly changing screen scaling to low, which seems to have the most effect and then we were able to get much better results into the 40s. I was excited to test Call of Duty Mobile because I personally think it's one of the more impressive Android games, and here with the max graphics settings we get a stable 60 FPS, and the processor still has headroom to spare. And I really thought we'd be able to get 120Hz here, I mean, that'd be awesome for a shooter, right? But here with the lowest graphics and the max FPS settings, we only got 60 FPS. My Galaxy S23 Ultra is able to get 120Hz, so I really think this one is just not strong enough here. Starting off emulation with the easier stuff, we're using Drastic, one of the best DS emulators on Android. I didn't upscale my games in this test, but the CPU and GPU still have some juice to spare for an extra boost. The DS is pretty old by now, so you can expect to play any game and even max out the upscaling up to 4 times if you wanted. Now moving to something a bit harder to run, we have God of War 2 running on EtherSX2, a popular PS2 emulator. I'm upscaling to two times native and it runs pretty good at 60 FPS. But when I go to three times, you can see and hear the lag here. With all the emulators I've tried, you need to get the stable FPS or else you get slow mo like this. I've always been so amazed with 3DS emulation ever since I first tried it on Citra. It opens you up to so many great titles to try, and I think it has really cool features like the 3D effects, custom shaders, and especially netplay, which lets you connect with other people online like the real thing. I think playing these kinds of games on the phone is super cool, like I never really owned a 3DS, allegedly, so I appreciate playing these kinds of games. They also look better than older DS games and even on the original 3DS hardware thanks to upscaling. I didn't try any upscaling here, but I was getting some issues with 100% GPU usage, so I changed that down to 97, and it pretty much stopped the stuttering I was getting. Here with Dolphin, a 2-in-1 GameCube and Wii emulator, we can upscale our games, use Netplay to connect with others, and a lot more too, like HD texture packs and gyro controls. Here in the test footage, I'm only using native resolution, which is 640 by 528 p and we can see it's not stressing out the CPU or GPU at all here. So I did test it with 3 times native resolution, which is 1080p, and we are still at only around 50% usage, which gives us plenty of headroom if we want to go even further. And on the Wii emulator, I didn't adjust the resolution or anything, but we can see our GPU and CPU still have a good amount of headroom to spare. So you can probably upscale this one a bit, or add an HD texture pack too. I remember 5 years ago I got Dolphin running in a video where I tested cool ways to play on a Chromebook. It did surprisingly well, so check that out in the right hand corner if you want to see how it did. For settings in Citra, I'm running the emulator at a slightly reduced speed, which seemed to fix my crashing issues I was getting. There's lots of other settings to change here, but the ones we'll probably use the most are the internal resolution slider here. In Dolphin, I didn't change much either besides compiling shaders before start, and also adjusting the internal resolution as I mentioned earlier. 
Okay, and here's my favorite part of the video. This is Winlater, a full-fledged Windows emulator on Android. I actually never got around to testing it fully until making this video. And sure, we're just playing at 720p, but for a five-year-old device, this kind of performance on AAA titles is crazy. I've seen some of the stuff on Reddit from the newer Snapdragon chips, but even this Snapdragon 865 has some juice in it, as we could play Tomb Raider from 2013 at around 30 FPS. Before we look at footage in-game, I want to test out the in-game benchmark, as I always love benchmarking that on this channel with my budget devices. With the normal graphics preset, we get an average of 33.7 FPS, but I did do a run without screen recording, and I got an average of 36 FPS there. And here in game, it's running a bit slower like I said, but there is a lot of effects on screen in this opening level, so I'll give it that. But even with this kind of performance, you can get through playing these slower paced games that don't require twitchy movements or anything. And honestly, I was having fun playing it here. I've already beat this game on PC, so I'm not going to play it on my phone, but now I know there's the option to. Next up, we're looking at the Pojav launcher, which lets you play the Java version of Minecraft on your phone. See, I never played Minecraft on the phone really because Bedrock Edition was just never for me. But now that I can play Java, even with mouse and keyboard as you'll see later on, this really lets you do so much more, even connecting to online servers if you wanted. With 16 chunks, we're getting 90 FPS or so, but lower it down a bit and you can get a nice and smooth 120Hz. I wonder how well shaders would run on this phone. Maybe in a future video I'll look at that and compare it to the S23 Ultra. And now we look at my favorite game streaming app, Moonlight. I remember when the first Steam Link hardware came out in 2015, I used that and was so amazed at the possibilities. Being able to stream to a display to game or watch movies felt so futuristic back then. But now, 10 years later, I use Moonlight because it has better latency, and for games like God of War Ragnarok here, we're getting about 120 FPS which feels great, but playing more fast paced games like Rocket League actually didn't work out too well in my opinion. That's a shame because on my mini PC I tested before, I was able to play shooters like the finals and it felt good enough. But maybe Rocket League just relies a bit more on fast inputs. And I'll go over settings so you get an idea of what's going on. For video resolution, I have it at native full screen, which is 2400 by 1080 p with 120 FPS for the frame rate, and I have bitrate set to 35.5. It's a shame that the Galaxy S20 Plus can't handle 1440p and 120Hz at the same time, but maybe it's a blessing in disguise, because now we can run the games at 1080p on our gaming PC, which will be a lot faster. Another really cool thing I like to do with my Galaxy phones is use Samsung DeX. DeX transforms the phone's Android interface into a familiar desktop style environment, all powered by the phone. First I loaded up Pojav Launcher to get the real Minecraft Java experience with mouse and keyboard. I'm really amazed that the phone can do something like this. 10 years ago I remember looking for ways to get the Java edition on your phone, but you could only play on Bedrock Edition back then, which I view as kind of a cut back version of Minecraft for older systems. But then I switched gears to productivity, because I think a lot of people don't realize that their smartphone would suffice for basic computer tasks like browsing the web, working on documents, and much more. I can snap Google Chrome and Google Docs side by side. This makes working a little bit easier. Dex even lets you use multiple displays to have a dual monitor set up if you really wanted. And pro tip, you could still use your phone while you're using Dex. One of the best features that Samsung took away was the option for a micro SD card. The Galaxy S20 series was special because it was the last in the lineup to have it, and here I'm using a 512GB one, so it expands the storage massively from the pitiful 128GB. I really wish they still had it, because even my newer S23 Ultra only has 256 gigs, but I find that I want more. No matter what phone you have though, you could always use a USB-C to USB-A adapter with any USB flash drive. Here I have a 256GB one from Patriot, and it gets picked up immediately by the phone. Of course you wouldn't walk around with this in there like an SD card, but it's convenient to store away your photos or videos quickly. Just make sure to unmount it first in the Files app before yoinking it out. Not sure exactly why that's important, but probably bad luck or something. Another reason I decided to keep this phone instead of sell it for some extra cash is because it still works as a great camera and webcam. I set up my phone above the monitor with the ring light, and I think the light helps a lot. 
Here's me doing a sample recording with the Galaxy S20 as the webcam and the mic as audio. And this app is cool. You could change the backgrounds a little bit. So right now I have a bokeh filter. We could, we could blur, we could do green screen. We could do, what is this? I think this is transparent. So I guess if you wanna, you know, have an empty background and then there's lots of other settings you could change. The app is called IV Cam. And when I tried streaming like six years ago, this was what I used and I would get compliments on the video quality. I have it set to 4K 60 FPS with the high video quality setting. But besides that, I haven't changed much. For the phone camera settings like focus and exposure, I leave it at auto so it does what's best. So the Galaxy S20 Plus is a pretty insane phone for under 200 USD. We see that the phone is a beast even playing graphically intense PC games like Tomb Raider from 2013 which still amazes me by the way. The fact that you can connect a mouse and keyboard too is just crazy. Let me know if you want to see any other benchmarks with other games on win later. I have a couple other high-end androids that are even stronger than this. And if you're interested in handheld gaming at all, I think you'll really like my last video where I checked in with the ROG Ally two years after it was released.